Hello everyone, welcome to this presentation on how to survive the coming tribulation, which is the seven last or the seven last plagues, the presentation about the seven last plagues. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you forgive us from our sins. Be merciful to us, Lord. Please send the Holy Spirit to be with me and my viewers as we study your word, that your words may have life that we might avoid the seven last plagues. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The mighty nation of Egypt was the most highly civilized empire then in existence. Years before, a God-fearing slave named Joseph <clears throat> had been elevated to prime minister and saved the nation from famine. But now he was forgotten. The friendly pharaohs who had known and admired Joseph had long since passed to their graves. The new rulers viewed the rapidly multiplying Israelites as a threat to national security, fearing that in the event of a war, the Israelites might join themselves with the enemies of Egypt. So the children of Israel were placed in bondage and forced to become slaves under the grinding tyranny, tyranny of the Egyptians. Exodus 2, 23 and 24 says, Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. Exodus 2, 23 and 24. Our God is a faithful God. When he makes promises, he always keeps them. He had made and he had made a promise to the patriarchs. He had promised that he would bless their gen descendants, the very people who we are now being oppressed in, who are now being oppressed in Egypt. And what would, would God's what would God's response be? He was preparing a deliverer, Moses. Though a Hebrew was raised in the house of Pharaoh's daughter, he became one of the most powerful men in Egypt. The Bible says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt, chance, and was mighty in words and deeds, Acts 7.22. But Moses made the mistake of thinking that he could deliver Israel from Egypt by doing things his way. When it became known that he had killed an Egyptian slave master, he had to flee the country. For 40 years, Moses tended sheep out of the, in the lonely desert. There he learned about himself. He learned about his loving God, caring for the sheep. He learned patience and gentleness. A gun was the self-confidence he had displayed as a young prince in Egypt's course, courts. God saw that he was now ready. In an encounter at a burning bush in the desert, God gave Moses his instructions. He was told to return to Egypt and to confront the mighty Pharaoh. He was to lead his people to freedom and to the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To help Moses in accomplishing his tremendous mission, God instructed Moses' older brother Aaron to go out and meet Moses. Not only would Aaron lend moral support, but he could also serve as Moses' spokesman, since Moses had not used the Egyptian language for so many years. With boldness, the two brothers entered Pharaoh's palace. One a humble median shepherd, once humble, one humble median shepherd, still clutching his shepherd's rod, and the other a local Hebrew slave. When Aaron stated that they came with a message from the Lord requesting that Pharaoh let his people go. Pharaoh snorted with hatred. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Exodus 5, 2. Instead of letting his valuable slaves go, Pharaoh increased their workload. But God would soon let the proud king know something about the Lord of Israel. Pharaoh was warned by Moses and Aaron that God would send one plague after another upon Egypt until the king allowed the Israel's Israelites to go. The Lord's message to Pharaoh was, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Exodus 7.17 7, 
It wasn't long before the plagues began to fall, as just as God has promised. Ten plagues to be exact. Before each plague, Aaron and Moses warned fellow Pharaoh of the judgment to come, hoping that he would release the children of Israel and spare himself and his nation from the disaster that was about to occur. But each time God gave him an opportunity to change his mind, Pharaoh chose instead to harden his heart. And, as predicted, unique calamities began to fall upon the Egyptians. First, the water in the Nile returned turned to blood. The fish died and all the rest of the water sources in Egypt turned into blood for seven days. But Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. Next, a plague of frogs invaded the land. Millions of them, they were in the food, in the beds, everywhere. Yet still, the stubborn king refused to let Israel go. A plague of lies came next. But even this couldn't change Pharaoh's mind. It's important to know that while these first three plagues fell on all who lived in Egypt, including the Hebrews, the seven remaining plagues would not affect God's people. Listen to what God said. And in that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall be. Exodus 8, 22 and 23. God's people would be spared from the last seven plagues. The fourth plague was an infestation of lice that filled the land of Egypt, except for Goshen, where the Israelites lived. The fifth plague was a terrible disease that swept across the country, destroying the animals and livestock. Pharaoh became furious, curious, had the animals in Goshen really been spared from the disease? Then Pharaoh sent, and he did. Not even one of the livestock of the Israelites died. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Exodus 9, 7. The sixth plague brought boils on man and livestock. But still, he, the determined monarch, refused to release the children of Israel. Moses next predicted a seventh plague of hail. God even suggested that preparations be made to save human and animal life. And those who heed the warning were able to survive the terrible hailstorm. By now, the Egyptians could clearly see that the elements of nature were under control of God of the Hebrews. They should have understood that their only safety was in obeying God's commands for a short for a few short moments, Pharaoh even considered allowing Israel to go. But as the plague subsided, so did his intentions. Moses warned that the eighth plague would be an incredible plague of locusts. Shocked by the thought of more this, this devastating plagues, Pharaoh's counselors pleaded with him to let the Israelites go as requested. But the king still refused. The locusts ate what little was left of the land of Egypt. Then came the ninth plague, three days of darkness, so intense that it could be felt. But the Pharaoh, the rebellious Pharaoh, continued to defy the God of heaven. Moses informed the king that one more plague would be poured about upon the Egyptians. A destroying angel would pass through the land of midnight at midnight and would slaughter all the firstborn in Egypt both humans and animals. Again, the Hebrews were to be spared, but this time they had something to do. They were instructed to slay a lamb and sprinkle some of its blood on the doorposts of their house as a sign of their faith and loyalty to the Lord. God promised, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Exodus 12, 13, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. What a night that must have been. Thousands of Hebrew families and many Egyptians watched as the fathers sprinkled blood on the lamb of the lamb on the doorposts. As it came to pass, Exodus 12, 29, at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock, Exodus 12, 29. But in the homes of the, Heb 
of where the blood had been sprinkled, in obedience to God's instructions, not one firstborn had been touched by the plague. Throughout the vast land of Egypt, the cries of the mourners could be heard. Pharaoh remembered how he ridiculed the Hebrews' God and had defiantly said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? Exodus 5.2 Now he knew, humbly, the king and his counselors sent for Moses and Aaron and urged them to quickly leave the land of Egypt. God's people were set free. And just as God had directed, they were prepared for a quick departure from Egypt. With sandals already on their feet and coats on their backs, they quickly started on their journey to the promised land. The story of the plagues of Egypt is, now just a is not just a fascinating by biblical history. It is used in the book of Revelation as a type or metaphor of what is to take place in the last days. These end-time prophecies make it crystal clear that once again plagues will fall, but on an even more devastating scale. This time, there will not be ten plagues, but only seven, and they are called the seven last plagues, apparently in reference to the last plagues in Moses Day. And once again, God's people will be protected during the seven last plagues at the end of time. The everlasting gospel will have been preached to the entire world. The call of the second angel to come out of spiritual Babylon with its religious confusion will have been given at that time. And to every man, the third angel proclaims, If anyone, Revelation 14, 9 and 10, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead and on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. This is one of the strongest warnings in the Bible. The issues will be clear. Men and women will need to choose between commandments of God and the commandments of men. Those who obey man instead of God will receive the mark of the beast and bring the judgment of God upon them. And when those final decisions have been made, probation's door closes forever. The solemn announcement is made. Revelation 22, 11, He who is unjust, let him be unjust. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation 22, 11. Christ's work as our high priest in heaven will have been ended. Every person will have decided for eternal life or eternal death. And then the wrath of God against sin will be experienced by those who have rejected his salvation. To the prophet John was given a view of what would this time be like in Revelation 15.1. Then I saw another sign in heaven Great and marvelous seven angels have, having the seven last plagues from, for in them the wrath of God is complete. Revelation 15. 1. And again John wrote, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowels of the wrath of God on the earth. But you ask, what are these terrible plagues about that are to be poured out with the seven angels upon the wicked? That's a good question. As we let our Bible give the answer, you will notice that these plagues are strikingly similar to those Egypt experienced in Moses' day. Revelation 16 2. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. At the same time, perhaps originating from a different place, another calamity strikes. Revelation 16.3, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it came, became blood as of, the dead, as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. But the third plague closely related to the second. Then in Revelation 6, 4, Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of waters, and they became blood. Imagine 
how ghastly it would be to turn on the faucet to get a drink and blood comes out but this judgment is justified for the angel declares you are righteous O lord because you have judged these things revelation 16 5 and 6 for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink now during this desperate time of thirst will be the promise be fulfilled to the righteous isaiah 33 16 bread will be given his water will be sure isaiah 33 16 then the bible describes the fourth plague to be poured out then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and the power was given to him to scorch men with fire and men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of god who has power over this place and they did not repent and give him glory revelation 16 8 and 9. then the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the headquarters of the beast then the fifth angel poured out on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain they blasphemed the god of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did nothing did not repent of their deeds revelation 16 10 and 11. by this text we discover that these plagues are not all universal nor are they all immediately fatal those under the fifth plague are still suffering from the source of the first plague apparently these plagues fall successively rather than simultaneously as their effects persist from one to another when the sixth plague is poured out it's it precipitates the final battle of armageddon revelation 16 12 and 14. then the sixth plague the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared and i saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet for they are spirits of demons performing signs let's go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of the of god almighty and the verse 16 says and they gathered them together to the place called in hebrew armageddon this will be a worldwide struggle but not like some might have imagined to be the battle of armageddon will be fought by jesus himself but before that comes the last and final plague then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out from the temple of heaven and from the throne saying it is done and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great great earthquake and then every island fled away and the mountains were not found and a great hail from heaven fell upon men its hailstone about the way of a talent men blasphemed god because of the plague of the hail since that plague was exceedingly great some scholars place the weight of biblical talent at around 57 pounds or 26 kilograms no one can imagine the destruction of such a storm hail storm would cause and the bible says that the lord will interrupt the calamities destroying the planet now i saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war and the armies in heaven clothed with fine linen white and clean followed him on white horses now on his mouth goes a sharp sword and with it he would strike the nations he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty god revelation 19 11 and 14. jesus will return to deliver his people from this world and that is confirmed this world that is confirmed in rebellion and rebellion but you may ask how can i be certain of god's protection when the plagues begin to fall 
There is only one way. Those who demonstrated their faith in the coming Redeemer by sprinkling the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts were delivered from the final plague in Egypt. When the destroying angel passed over their houses, they were safe. They had followed God inst God's instructions and commands. And again, God's people will be spared when the plagues fall if they have accepted the Lamb of God as their sacrifice and allowed His blood to cleanse their hearts from sin. We are choosing today which side we will be on that day, God's side or the side of a rebellious angel. And friend, today, the day, this is the day to decide. When the angels begin to pour out the plagues, it will be too late. The opportunity for salvation will forever be closed. Won't you place yourself today on God's side under the protection of the blood of Jesus Christ? Now, the saddest words ever to be uttered are, The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. Jeremiah 8.20 the story is told of an Australian lumberman who built a little cabin on the edge of the forest. It wasn't much, but it was home for him. One day as he returned home from work, he was stunned and heartbroken to find his little cabin just a heap of smoldering ruins. All that was left were a few pieces of chattered lumber and some metal blackened by the flames. He walked out to the place where his old chicken coop had stood. All that he found was a mold of ashes and some burned wire. Aimlessly, he shuffled through the debris. Then, glancing down at his feet, his eye caught a curious sight, a mound of charred feathers. Idly, he kicked it over. And what do you suppose happened? Four little fuzzy baby chicks crumbled out, miraculously protected by the wings of a loving mother hen. In the most beautiful and meaningful language of Scripture, God describes what he longs to do for every one of his children on earth when the plagues fall. Psalm 91, 1-11 He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take his refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the tenor terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waits at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand on your right hand, but you shall not come near, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look, and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling Place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he has given his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Psalms 91, 1-11 Could anything be more reassuring? A loving God promises to hide us under his wings. We don't need to worry about plagues or how we will survive. We need only to turn our lives to Him, and He will protect us like a hen protects her chicks. God loves you, my friend. He died for you. His anger is against the sin that causes pain and death, but not against you. Even now, His Spirit is pleading in your hearts, let go of sins, to let them be covered by the blood of the Lamb.